Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, evening, and morning. I want to welcome every welcome everyone to our workshop today, Focus Group Fundamentals with Measurement and Evaluation alum Tiffany Smith. My name is Yasmin Shimchek, and I am one of the moderators for today, uh, together with another student from our program, Gabby Huff. At American University, we are committed to pursuing inclusive excellence. One of our practices shared by our Indigenous and Native communities is to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meetings and events. The goal is to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nacotchtonk, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Those of you who are attending our events know that we always provide a land acknowledgement. I would encourage you today to take a step further and do some research on the land where you're sitting. If you are not aware of the history of the land, you can click on the link in the chat and research it, or send a text to the number in the chat that Gabby is going to pop in now. So before we get started, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. So if you'd like, you can write in the chat box where you're joining us from, and I'll read out a few of those to share with everybody. I see Minnesota, Alexandria, Egypt. Kingston, Jamaica, St. Louis, Missouri, Maryland, Newfoundland in Canada, Kennesaw, Georgia, Afghanistan, DC, Boston, New York. Oh my gosh, keep it coming guys, United Kingdom. This is great, Florida. Welcome everybody. Do we have anybody in the Facebook live stream? It doesn't appear that anybody has joined us from there yet, um, but I'm sure somebody will join us shortly. I'll let you know. Sounds good. Well, we'd love to hear where, where you are from when you join, um, and we're really excited to get started. So without further ado, uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section of the chat. We'll have some time for questions at the end of the presentation today. Our speaker today is Tiffany Smith, Smith, who is an alumna of our measurement and evaluation program. So take it away, Tiffany. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I'm going to echo that good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you come from. I'm so happy to hear there are so many people who decided to join us today. Um, so this is my presentation, Focus Groups, the Fundamentals. It's going to be uh, a high-level overview of what focus groups are, some tips and tricks for recruitment and how to conduct them. You know, I'm pretty sure some people in, you know, this space today um, have done focus groups, so this might be a little refresher for you. If you have some fun tips and tricks and, you know, ideas and input about how you've run focus groups that have been really successful for you in the past, feel free um, to put those reflections and those thoughts in the chat. We want to have the, a collaborative, dynamic space today where I'm giving you some information, but you all can feel free to share information as you please. All right, and if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to talk about the agenda for today. So first, we're going to do um, a biography. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, and then we're going to go over presentation objectives because I just want to let you know what are we going to accomplish today or what ideally are we going to accomplish today. Um, I'm next going to follow with an overview of focus groups. I'm going to go into the details of what they are, um, how they are conducted, um, and how you recruit for them, how to prepare for them. Next, we are going to summarize what we've learned. I do have some summary videos here that hopefully we can um, have work today. And after that, we're going to put our knowledge to the test. I have a video giving examples of a good focus group and examples of a focus group that needs a little bit of improvement. <laughs> and uh, we're going to, um, you know, kind of discuss that and you all going to offer your reflections on that. And lastly, we're going to end with some conclusions and takeaways. 
So this next slide here, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about who I am. I think it's important that you get to know your speaker um, a little bit. Um, so first and foremost, my name is Tiffany Smith. I live in the United States. Um, I live in California, uh, particularly in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area in California. I was uh, born and raised in California, uh, but I am proudly Ghanaian of my ethnicity. Um, I have utilized both uh, qualitative and quantitative methods um, in evaluation uh, of public health for the past eight years. I, I actually served in the United States Peace Corps uh, in Zambia from 2015 to 2017. And after that, I actually stayed in Zambia and I worked for the United States Agency for International Development, um, where I was a site visit co coordinator uh, from 2017 to 2018. Um, I am currently a project director at CARE Consulting Group. I've been there since uh, 2022, so it's been about two years now. And I am also an evaluation and health equity advisor for cities and people advisors. I've been doing that for a year now. I am alumni of the Master in Measurement and Evaluation Program um, at American University. And I also have a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Los Angeles. All right, and on this next slide here, I'm going to go into the objective for today. Wonderful. Okay, so the first objective is that participants will define a focus group, understand the different types of focus groups, and know when it's appropriate to conduct a focus group. Next, participants will learn useful preparation tips for a focus group. And lastly, participants will learn useful tools in managing focus groups and addressing common focus group challenges. This next slide here is a title slide to first start us off with what are focus groups? I know some of you have an idea, you may or may not have an idea what focus groups are, so I'm going to give you just a definition of how focus groups are defined on this next slide here. So a focus group is a method of research involving a small group of people who are guided through a discussion by a moderator or a facilitator. Focus groups can be used to explore a variety of different issues, to test solutions, to explore uh, the group's perspective of a problem, and to generate ideas. Now, this next slide here is a title slide. I'm going to lead you into what are the different types of focus groups. So first, we have um, so a different version of constructive focus groups. And it, for those of you who are familiar with focus groups, these are the ones that you probably are going to be um, you know, well addressed to. So first, you have the typical focus group, which lasts between one to two hours uh, with around eight participants. So when I say typical focus group, these are the ones that we talk about where you, you know, you have you recruit someone, they show up to, you know, your focus group, and you know, you have a facilitated, moderated discussion for about an hour to two. And like I said, there are about eight participants. So this is the very common form of focus groups that some of us might be familiar with. Next, we have extended focus groups. Oh, sorry, on the same slide. No problem. So you have extended focus groups. Um, so when I mean extended focus groups is that you can extend the duration of a session for up to three hours. And that really allows you to explore a more complex or detailed topic. I can give you an example of this in my career. You know, I actually did um, an extended about three hour focus group because I was doing a focus group with community members of a local county out here in Northern California. And we were discussing mental health um, services that are available in the county. It's a very important topic, especially during this, you know, a little bit after COVID era where we started to have really important conversations about mental health. So we decided to extend um, the focus group to be about three hours so that we can really get into the nuanced details um, about service delivery of mental health and how it can be tailor-made and reflective of the needs of the community. 
So that's an example of when you might want to extend your focus group so you can explore a more complex or detailed topic. So I have done that before as well. Also, lastly on this slide, we have mini focus groups. So mini focus groups can be used also to explore difficult, sensitive, or challenging topics. But because of the nature of the topic, you might want to decrease the size to be around four or six participants because you want to treat said topic with the sensitivity and the respect that it deserves. So those are some examples of constructed focus groups that are really common types of focus groups that we know about. On this next slide here, we're going to talk about ready-made focus groups. So there are two types of ready-made focus groups. The first is a group of friends. Um, sometimes it can be useful, especially with young people or where friends share commonalities that you are interested in learning, that you can do focus groups with a group of friends. I have actually had the pleasure of doing focus group with a group of friends, and it was very lovely. Um, they knew each other very well. They had a comfort with each other. They had rapport with each other. And we were able to have a really dynamic discussion. And it was great. Sometimes when I asked the question, they would sometimes, you know, punch the question or follow up with, you know, saying, hey, this person has this experience. I think they could also shed some light on this question. And they were comfortable with each other to do that because they already knew each other and they really fed off of each other's energy. And we were able to have a lot of rich information that we gathered from that focus group. So it has been really beneficial for me in my career, depending on the topic and depending on the situation, um, to do a focus group with group of friends. Also, there's support or community groups. I've done those as well. And, and those allow you to explore complex topics in a group where participants are also already comfortable with each other. So I've done focus groups, you know, with community members who, um, you know, are a part of the same, you know, group, who are a part of the same, you know, community organization, and who are a part of, you know, the same, um, you know, circle, if you will. Um, and they have been able to shed light on really important topics as well. I give the example of the extended focus group that I did with people around mental health services. I also did an additional one uh, for this county uh, around mental health services, but it was with community groups. So there were a lot of community advocacy groups um, that I did um, focus groups with as well. And that also really allowed me to explore the really complex topics um, and especially surrounding uh, mental health. So I found that to be extremely effective as well. All right. And on this next slide here, um, we talked about, we're talking about structured groups. So this is the last type of common focus group is a structured focus group. So first off, when we, you know, use structured focus groups, we really want to use them to solve problems. So workshops, for example, can are a good way to do these structured, uh, you know, focus groups and these structured workshops. Um, they can be used to generate ideas, um, explore detailed issues, or to co-design the improvement of a service or program. And these groups can engage more participants. Um, and from anywhere between 50, 15 to 20 plus individuals. And also within larger workshops, you can also choose to incorporate smaller subgroups within those larger workshops to cover um, a range of issues. All right. And on this next slide here, um, I want to give you some tips about, you know, when focus groups can be useful, because as researchers or as evaluators, you know, whatever your field is, you want to be able to decide whether a focus group is right for you or whether you want to conduct a focus group. So I do have some tips and bullet points here about, you know, when focus groups can be useful um, on this next slide here. Yeah, and Tiffany, I just want to pause for a second and, and say there's some great questions coming into the chat. Um, would you prefer to kind of answer those as they come in or we can hold them right until the end for you? Um, yeah, you know, I actually saw them pop up and I was wondering, I was like, do you want me to answer them now or later? I think that um, Heron has some good questions. Do you want to walk me through them? Sure, of course. So the first one uh, that Haroon asked was, what are the advantages and disadvantages of FGD? Okay, 
And when you say FGD, can you tell me what that acronym is? I'm sorry, focus. Imagine focus group discussion, right, Haroon? Or just focus group discussion? Okay. I just want to make sure that I was right about that. So I actually, Erin, I actually have some tips later on in this slide um, about focus group discussions that are disadvantages and advantages. So if you can hang tight to that question, I actually have a slide addressing that. For sure. And I think you probably will address a couple of these other questions as well around successful FGDs, the purpose of FGDs. Um, and why we use those mm -hmm. qualitative data collection. So we'll get through that. And then Haroon, if you still have questions, please send them on. Yes, that, those are perfect, Haroon. I think I have some slides that would definitely address some of your questions. We can definitely get to it if, if you want more details. And also, I think you asked another question of how would you describe the current attitudes or opinions within your community regarding any project? I think we can. Um, do that one later as well because we can really get into that question i want to make sure that i get through all the content and i see marla's question here about are there any important ethical considerations we should keep in mind when doing focus group discussions there are and i do have some slides um, about that as well and then after we're done with the slides we can get back to it if you have more questions on that but these are excellent questions but i think we're going to get to a lot of these in the presentation so thank you thank you all right, thank you so much, Gabby, for doing that, monitoring the chat for me. All right, so a focus group uh, can be useful uh, when, number one, you are thinking about introducing a new service or program. Um, you want to uncover underlying causes for problems. You want to identify local issues. You want to prioritize the specific areas in which there is a need for action or you want to explore practical or workable solutions. Uh, you want to ask questions that can't easily be asked or answered on a written survey. Uh, this is either through use of visual prompts or sharing information, or you want to complement any existing knowledge you gain from written surveys or desk research. So this last point for me is really important because I look at focus groups as being really complementary to survey data. So I usually, you know, partner focus groups with surveys because surveys are really good to get really structured data and to get really structured responses on certain types of questions. I really love that. However, focus groups really allow you to get more detailed, nuanced information that can be really complementary and to and explain, you know, survey responses in more details. It can really give you that rich information that you're not always able to get in a survey, which can be way more structured. So I just really wanted to highlight that last point that is, you know, it's really important for me always to complement my survey research or my desk research with the focus group because it gives me that rich nuanced information that I don't always get from the surveys, even though surveys are really, really great. There um, is more that can be said. There's always a story to tell and the focus groups allow you to really discover what that story is. And next, we're going to talk about the uh, pros and cons of focus groups. So on this next slide here, when and why you would conduct a focus group. So I'm going to go through some of the strengths that I discovered um, of focus groups. So some of the strengths of focus groups are that focus groups can explore attitudes and opinions that are not likely to be captured in other forms of research, like I said, through your desk research or through surveys. Focus groups are a good way of gathering data using fewer resources, just time and money, um, than other types of research, such as large surveys or one-to-one -one interviews. And focus groups can be used to solve problems, like I've stated before, uh, generate ideas and really explore issues in detail in a way that is not possible in other types of research. And focus groups um, allow you to explore shared experiences and speak to um, a target demographic about certain issues. Right. Those focus groups are a lot of really great strengths with focus groups. Now, I have weaknesses on this other part of the slide here. I use the term weakness loosely. I, I just think that um, just things to consider, right, of when thinking about focus groups. There are a lot of strengths, but it's just the things to consider is that, you know, focus groups rely heavily on the skills of the moderator, right? So if you're in the position of being the moderator or facilitator, they rely heavily on you. Uh, and this might 
in some sort of way affect the quality of the evidence gathered because we want to make sure that the moderator is really able to guide the conversation and really able to manage the conversation. And we actually had some slides about how to effectively manage the conversation. The analysis of the focus groups can be complex, right? Because you're getting a lot of that qualitative data, you're getting no stories, and the data gathered will depend, once again, on the skills of the, of the note taker. And we'll talk about, you know, the role of the note taker a little bit later and on what they pick from the responses, right? Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes focus groups, you know, you can have, you can run into some challenges uh, about recruiting. Um, and it says attendance can be voluntary and if an inefficient number of people may attend a planned focus group, but I do have some tips about how we can try to mitigate that challenge. Um, and focus groups um, can be difficult to recruit, like I said before, um, and incentives may need to be offered. Um, in order to get people to come, but we want to just be aware that I have never had this experience, but just be aware in the field that incentives may, uh, may bias views our opinions, because if you're giving them, you know, an incentive, they might want to, you know, speak more positively because they're very thankful that you have an incentive. However, that's just something to be aware of because in my personal experience, I have given incentives as a good way to get people to show up. It has really contributed to people showing up and they have really shown up and they've given really, really honest feedback. Um, so, but that's just something that I want you all to consider about, you know, the recruitment uh, focus groups. And that's why I included some slides here um, about how we can recruit a little bit later in the presentation. So this next slide, I want to talk about, before you get started with the focus group, what do you do, right? What are the preparation steps? Because I think that's really important to go through. Um, on this next slide, in terms of prepping for your focus group, number one, what you want to do is define the purpose and main topics of the interview or focus group, right? I'm just going to use focus group for, for the sake of this presentation, but you can also do this if you're doing interviews as well. So first and foremost, you want to be able to explain in your own words, not reading the introduction of the protocol, what the purpose of the focus group is and what the main topics are that you will be asking about. Getting clear about the purpose of the interview or the focus group uh, will help you answer questions that participants might ask and will help focus your efforts. So you really want to feel comfortable when you go into the focus group, you really want to feel comfortable about what is the purpose? What are we trying to achieve here? Why are we here? And you want to be able to confidently and eloquently explain that to the group, right? So in your prepping for the focus group, think about it. Define the purpose. Why are you gathering people? Why are you interested in having people gather together to talk about this topic? The next um, tip here is and really know your focus group protocol. And when I say focus group protocol, I really mean the set of questions that you are going to ask the, uh, the focus group participants, right? So before you conduct the focus group, please review the focus group questions and make sure that you are familiar with each question. This will really help you feel comfortable shifting the order of the questions if need be based on the conversation. Um, and just really want you to think about, you know, how much time you will need to spend on each question. And it runs more smoothly when you're really familiarized, uh, you really familiarize yourself with your focus group, you know, protocol and with the questions. So you're not looking down on the paper the entire time. And since you're familiar with the questions in your mind, if a participant asks, Ask them, ask them, excuse me, answer the question in a certain way um, that leads to another question that's already on your protocol, you can quickly segue um, into that next question and be able to confidently, you know, hop around your protocol if need be, if you're familiar with those questions. So please, before you go uh, to a focus group, make sure that your questions um, are really, really familiar to you and you kind of know them off heart. And once again, lastly, understand the purpose of all the focus group questions, right? So you want to understand what the question is, but you also want to understand why you're asking it, right? So this preparation will make it easier to ask follow-up questions if need be and clarifying questions during the focus group or reword questions if the participants need clarification about what you're asking. Um, I want you all to really think about, you know, before, well, as you're prepping for your focus, you'll think in advance about what probing questions 
And when I say probing questions, I mean really those, you know, questions that you can ask to get people really thinking about and reflecting on the question that you pose, right? Um, and you can really do those, you can take those, um, you know, probing questions to really draw out the necessary information from participants to meet the purpose of the focus group. So these are the three tips I have for prepping. You want to really define the purpose, know the purpose, know your questions, and understand the purpose of all your questions. Now, we want to talk about the logistics of the day, right? So say you're feeling good. Say you're like, oh my goodness, I have my purpose out. I have my questions. I know my questions backwards and forwards. I feel really, really good about this. That's one piece of it, right? And that's a really important piece. But we also want to talk about the logistics because there's a lot of planning um, that goes into focus groups that we want to consider. First, you want to consider space. Um, so it is important that participants um, to know uh, the conversation is private and what is shared in that room stays in that room, right? I want you all to think about choosing a location for the focus groups where other participants won't listen in or disrupt the conversation. And for focus groups, please, I want you all to think about, you know, setting up chairs um, around the table or in a circle so that everyone can really see each other and interact with each other and that the facilitator or and the note taker can see everyone in the group, right? So I think that there was a question about ethical concerns. So this is, I think this is kind of going to get to that as well, because when it comes down to considering space and, and what, um, you know, people are comfortable with, you want to choose a space that's private. You want to choose a space where there are other people who can listen in and other people who are participating can feel comfortable sharing. Another thing about ethical you know, considerations is the confidentiality. Right? Confidentiality is critical when it comes down to focus groups. You want to assure participants you will not use their name or any other identifying or personal information when sharing results. You want to tell participants not to share anything that they hear in the focus group with anyone outside of the focus group and reinforce that conversations that happen within the focus group are private and confidential. And these, you know, assurances uh, can really help participants feel more comfortable and open to sharing their opinion. Sometimes what I've done to with focus groups, like, you know, when you when I talked before about the purpose, after you state your purpose, you really want to tell them that this is why we're here. This is how this information will be used. It's going to remain confidential. I, you know, sometimes I've done you know, consent forms where that's all outlined about what the purpose of the focus group is, why you're here, and have everyone sign off on that in agreement. Because that's a part of that ethics, right? The people who participate in your focus group need to fully understand what it is that they're answering while they are here and they need to consent to it. And we need to make sure that you ask, you know, allow them to ask questions about why we're here, ask more clarifying questions about the purpose, to make sure that everyone in the group is comfortable with um, what the goals that you're trying to achieve that day. And getting their consent, not only to participate, but I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, getting their consent to record <laughs> um, is also really important too. So those are some of those ethical considerations that I think somebody was asking in the chat as well. Um, also, you want to start, you know, with introductions and when you also have your focus groups, right? So you have your space, you have the confidentiality that you ensure with people, and now you want to start, you know, building that rapport, building that comfort, right? Especially if these are people who don't really know each other. Um, so you want to start with introductions. What you want to do is you want to introduce yourself and your role uh, with the program and set participants' expectations for the focus group. Uh, your introduction should include, you know, your name, your role within your organization, and once again, tell the participants the purpose of the focus group and why you invited them. Explain what will, you know, be collected um, and how that information will be shared back. And also explain how long the conversation will last and ask to record the conversation. Something else that I want you all to think about too, and this is going back to that ethical question, is that I have told people that if there is any part of the conversation where we are recording and you don't want something to be shared on the recording, please ask me to stop the recording. I'm happy to do that. So I have actually stopped the recording, allowed someone to share, 
And after that, I've asked for their permission to start the recording again, and we've done that. I've also given people permission to say, you know, it's okay if, if you're not comfortable with the conversation, you can, you can choose to not participate anymore. You know, I have had people come and show up to, you know, a focus group, and after hearing the purpose, after hearing the goal, they've expressed, you know, not really feeling comfortable participating anymore, and I've said, okay, that's fine. You have more than every right to not participate after, you know, I've explained the purpose, and even throughout the focus group, if you hear the lining of questions and you're just like, I don't feel comfortable for this, with this, I've also allowed people to say, you know, you can, you can definitely um, excuse yourself if you want, or on the, on Zoom, I've, you know, this is the era of Zoom, so I've done a lot of focus groups on Zoom as well, and I've had people put in the chat, I'm actually going to, you know, step away, and I'm like, I respect that, and thank you so much for coming, you know, so I just went back to another ethical thing, is that people have a right to opt in and opt out as they please, right? And lastly, you want to establish agreements. Tell participants that there are no right or wrong answers and that they should share their opinions and experiences candidly. In focus groups, participants do not always have to agree with what others say. Ask people to share agreement or disagreement verbally. So your note taker can include that in the chat, uh, in, in the notes, or if they're you know, over Zoom, ask them to do it verbally, or if they have thoughts, they don't share, um, feel comfortable sharing verbally, they can do it in the chat as well. Uh, remind participants that only one person can talk at a time so you can hear what everyone is saying. And, you know, honestly, we want people to participate. We want people to feel safe and comfortable participating, everyone. So let everyone know that this is a safe space for everyone to share their thoughts. Um, but not everyone really needs to answer every question, right? There are some questions that some people are not going to be interested in answering. So please like respect that, but also let the participants know that you would like to hear from everyone during the focus group. And I know I've spent a lot of time on that side, but I think it answers a lot of the questions that were in the chat. So next, oh yes, go ahead, Yasmin. So we have some logistical Q and A's. Um, our first uh, Q and A question. Oh, we do, okay, question. fantastic. Yeah, uh, so the first one is, could extended focus groups go beyond three hours? Is there a reason to cap it at three hours? Oh, yeah, the three hours was just from my personal experience. Um, I, I think that, you know, if depending on the topic and what you all feel comfortable with, you can extend it to like a half a day. Um, I would recommend that you provide lunch, <laughs> you know, or feed someone, you know, if you're going to keep them for a, for a longer period of time. But three hours is my personal experience is where, you know, you're able to get people energized and sometimes a little bit after three hours, people do get a little tired in my personal experience. So that's why I usually cap it at three hours is because that's when you can still get the creative juices from people and they're not too tired to get their feedback and you can still let them go and, and go out their day. However, if you want to do it longer to say about a half work day, about four hours, you can do that depending on the topic, but make sure that you give people a break and make sure that you maybe provide some food if you're going to extend it for that long um, in order to, you know, keep people there and make sure that they stay engaged and energized. That's a great question. Another question came in from the Q&A. Um, if you have a series of focus groups with different participants, how important is it to try to ask questions in the exact same way or order for internal validity? Yeah, that is also a really important question. So I'm going to go back to um, my mental health focus group because that was actually a series of focus groups. Um, however, they were with different communities. So I did a series of focus groups around mental health with communities, a, a lot of communities of color, um, with LGBTQ community, even with law enforcement, with educators. So those are very, very different types of people, right? So I had my general, you know, protocol that I used that were going to be like the general questions that I asked. However, based on the conversation and the perspective that I was gathering and getting, I did tailor and probe in a different way, depending on who my audience was, right? So I think that's a great question. When you have a series of focus groups and they're kind of like about the same topic, but you're asking different groups of people with different perspectives and different lens, I still think it's good to have a master protocol, like, a, like you know, overall general protocol that can be used to then be tailored to get the specific perspective of the people 
um, that you're talking to. So for example, when I did a focus group on mental health, the same mental health, but it was with the LGBTQ community, I really asked, particularly from your perspective as a trans person or as a queer person, right? How does this impact you or how can the county do better, particularly with your community in terms of the mental health services that they offer, right? So it, I, please still have that general overarching protocol, but when you have a series, definitely um, tailor some of your questions to the different perspective. And no, don't feel pressure to ask every single question in the same way. Definitely switch it around based on who you're talking to, who your audience is. Excellent question. This, the last logistical question that came in through the chat, and it's relevant to this slide, is um, is there any guidance that you might have on who should be moderating the focus group? Like um, they gave mm -hmm. an example of it, should it be someone internal to the organization? Should it be the evaluator? My question is, what happens if you don't speak the local language as your experience in the past? Yes. Oh my gosh, these questions are so good. Okay, so <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different ways to answer this. So I first I want to talk to language because language and culture is so incredibly important, right? Especially when you're talking to people of different linguist, linguistical backgrounds and different ethnicities. What I always like to do is when it, I always like to have someone who's reflective of that community host that focus group, right? So me as an African person, I have hosted, you know, focus groups particularly from people who are, you know, Black Americans, right? Because I was considered to be culturally congruent to them. And it's, there is a different level of, you know, comfort that we sometimes find uh, when people see themselves reflected in the facilitator and the facilitator can also ask questions in a certain way or frame their questions in a way that is very relatable to that group, right? I've also, you know, I can speak Spanish, but Spanish is actually not my first language. So when I have had Spanish speaking focus groups, I've always recruited a Spanish speaker. I think it's just really important because it's not just hey, you know my language, that's great, but there's a cultural component to it as well. And it's a cultural component that I can say that I do not have that experience because I am not, a, you know, a member of that community. So when I do think it's really important when it comes down to who the facilitator should be, when it's racial or ethnic groups, it's great to have the person be reflective of that community. It just brings out a more, you know, truthful and more honest, you know, answers from my experience. And people have been really comfortable sharing from the cultural perspective about why they feel the way that they feel. And especially when it comes down to language too. Um, you know, if I'm not a you know native Spanish speaker, so I speak it in a way that's not always, you know, vernacular, I use different words, and it's not the, it's not always the same, right? Um, so I think that's really important to have someone who's reflective of the community. Um, when it comes down to those type of focus groups. But when it comes down to organizational, what I like to do, I've always been the external evaluator, right? And sometimes people have said that they wanted me to conduct the focus group because they were afraid of, you know, a little bit of bias um, in the answers because they were already familiar uh, with, the, with the people who were conducting the focus group, right? So I've respected that. But my personal preference is that I always want someone who's either reflective of the community or internal to the organization to conduct the focus group in terms of that capacity building and being able for the, the organization to be able to do that themselves. I always prefer for the organization to do that. I support with making the protocol, you know, I support with, you know, being a note taker. I'm there in the room, um, but I don't always um, prefer to be um, the person conducting the focus groups if it's based on the organization because I still think it's good for the organization um, to do it in order for and also for them to be able to build that capacity to confidently you know conduct focus groups in their in their community but if they absolutely insist because they're afraid of that bias I will absolutely respect that and do it but my preference is always to have them do it and have someone who's linguistically and culturally congruent to the people who conduct focus groups excellent excellent question All right, are we going to get back to it now? Okay, perfect. Thank you, Yasmin. All right, I think I am on the recruitment slide, the next one after wonderful. So we're going to talk about recruitment. So when you have, um, you know, your focus group, you have your protocol, you have your questions, you have all those things, you got to get people to show up, right? So, so how can we do that? Um, so what you want to do is, uh, first off, you want to start with drawing up a list of possible invitees and map out all the relevant criteria on the diversity of the group, right? 
Um, so you want to think about gender, ethnicity, income, you know, brackets, you know, people with certain lived experience with disabilities, things like that, kind of like what I just talked about. Um, you want to be able to draw up a list of possible invitees and the criteria of who you want to come. For example, for, you know, for my mental health, you know, law enforcement, focus group that I did, I wanted to make sure that all the police chiefs were there. I wanted to make sure that, you know, anyone who represented law enforcement was there, right? Because that was a particular group that I was going for and they met that criteria, right? You should limit your set of criteria to no more than four or five points as narrowing down um, with um, more criteria can make recruitment a little bit difficult. Um, I want you to think about start recruiting these people through as many channels as possible. Uh, email, phone, local media, social media. I know a letter is a little bit antiquated, but maybe a letter if you find appropriate. But um, I have been really successful with focus, like recruiting for focus groups uh, by phone, actually, as for my personal experience, because I already had a list of people who were program recipients or participants in some sort of way and have the numbers. Um, so I emailed them first and then I followed up with a phone call and I felt like that personal touch uh, really did help with them, you know, wanting to participate. And they were also able to ask me questions over the phone about what it is, you know. So I really liked doing email first and then following up with the phone. Um, keep a list of all the confirmed participants and their contact information. Please do that after people have confirmed. Make sure you keep a list of all the people who have confirmed going to your, uh, your focus group. Send the confirmed participants a quick note or phone them um, a day or two ahead of the focus group day to ensure that they are still coming and, and that they've made all the necessary arrangements to come and also talk to them about the logistics, right? going to take place during this time at this location who will be served or not and after you're going to get a gift card so make sure that you contact the focus group participants about a day or two before to confirm that they're still coming but also to go over the logistics okay and next slide here is managing a successful conversation so these are some tips and tricks for the facilitator um so tips for management Ensure um, questions are fully answered. So the reason why I say this is because sometimes you will need to ask a question more than one way um, to make sure people understand it. Uh, you want to make sure that by the end of the conversation, you have all the information you hope to get. Please pause briefly and review the question that has just been under discussion to make sure that participants have fully and really addressed it before you move on, right? Don't be afraid to ask the question again or in a different way uh, to redirect participants back to the topic, right? Um, be comfortable with the silence. So that's something that we have to embrace as focus group moderators, right? And I can say for me, I'm a chatty person. I am a talker and I always feel the need to fill in silence with talking. <laughs> but with focus groups and in my career, I have learned that that's something that it's not always helpful, right? I need to be comfortable with that silence because when you first ask a question to someone, then you tend to process it, right? So before and after you ask a new question, allow for brief pauses and silences. This really gives people time to think about their responses or share additional thoughts. Please go with the flow on that and really kind of embrace um, that silence. If participants begin talking about something that they may have answered, uh, that, they, that may be an answer to a different question than the one you asked, then go with the flow um, and allow uh, the conversation to go in that direction. Um, however, remember, please try your best to go back to the questions that you have, uh, that you have not asked um, yet or that have not been answered because you want to be able to get um, the information that you are aiming to gather. Ask clarifying questions. So sometimes when people say things, they might not always elaborate um, as much as you would like for them to. So this is when you're gonna ask clarifying questions. And I wanna give you some examples of what those clarifying questions are um, and a way to probe to try to get more information. So you can say, hey, you know what? I literally liked what you said. I appreciate your reflection on that. And you said something that was very interesting. You said this, right? Could you explain a little bit more? Would you mind elaborating on that? Because I find it very interesting, right? And could you, you can say, you know, could you explain a little bit more what you mean when you said that? It was really interesting and I wanna learn more about that. Um, and then if you want to, you know, make sure that you understood what they said, you wanna say, hey, um, can I make sure that I have this right? This is what I heard from you. Is that accurate? Um, and then you could say, what I hear you saying is this. 
is that a fair or accurate interpretation? Can you can you make sure I'm on you know on the right page or please correct me, right? Um, you want to manage time, right? Uh, while it is important to make sure that participants address the question, it is also important to keep moving with the conversation so that you cover all of the most important questions in your protocol. Um, if you begin to run short on time, you may need to prioritize the remaining questions, right? Um, if you, it might help for you to put on a watch um, table. Um, I don't use watches. I haven't used watches in a really long time. I usually use my phone. Uh, but if you have a watch, um, or some way to keep time, uh, please uh, do that to make sure that you're keeping time with the conversation, right? You may want to explain to participants at the very beginning of the conversation that you will be keeping an eye out on time so that the conversation doesn't run too long. So if you do you know, look at your watch or if you do look at your phone, they already know that it's just for timekeeping um, and that you're not getting bored, you're not getting impatient, it's just to keep time, right? You just want them to be reassured with that. And lastly, please thank participants. I let participants know that their, their participation was important and useful and that, you're, that you appreciate their time and their courage uh, in sharing their thoughts. And please re restate how their input will be used. Absolutely need to make that clear again. How their input will be used, when it will be shared back, and the confidentiality, right? That's speaking to the ethical piece. All right, this next uh, slide here, um, addressing common focus group challenges. Tiffany, I'm just going to jump in with a question directly related to that oh, talking about. Charles asked, what are examples of ethical incentives for participants in a focus group discussion? Yeah, um, for the incentives, it's the gift cards, <laughs> you know, are normally uh, the safe uh, bet for me. Or, you know, sometimes it's the food too, right? Like there's no, you know, um ethical or conflict of interest concerns when it comes down to those things in my in my personal experience right like sometimes i haven't always given incentives but i've done focus groups in the evening time and i'm like hey i appreciate you so much for coming to this focus group we're going to have refreshments and we're going to have food you know there that's the form of an incentive but after my um my focus groups and they are they do have incentives and we didn't have food the gift cards are always really good. I usually give, you know, depending on my budget, about fifteen to twenty dollar gift cards to Target or Walmart. Or I use a retailer called Gift.com that has over two hundred retailers that they can choose from. So those are really, really common incentives. I feel like those are very safe ethical incentives where you don't have to worry about, you know, conflict of interest. Is to give it the gift cards after or provide food uh, during uh, the focus group. So excellent question. Thank you. Yeah, another one here is related to the number of participants in a focus group discussion. How do you know what is the most appropriate minimum or maximum for what you're doing? Yes, that's an excellent question. I actually uh, do have a slide about that later, but personal experience, industry standard, just general rules that people have felt most comfortable with is um, eight to 10 people. And that's for that general, that typical focus group that I talked about in the very beginning. Um, everyone who does focus groups and qualitative research, and Bev, you can chime in, um, but we usually advise between eight to 10 people because that's a good amount of people to be able to have a dynamic discussion, but it's not too much to where it's challenging for the facilitator uh, to be able to moderate and guide the conversation. I did say that there were certain situations where there might be like a workshop where there's more people, but then you'll have subgroups and you'll have different facilitators per per um, subgroup. But in terms of the very typical focus group that most of you are probably running, eight to 10 people is the industry standard of a good range. More than that is too much to moderate, a little bit less than that, you might not get as much good feedback and rich feedback as you would like. Um, so that's my suggestion on that. And that's always worked well for me. Great, thank you. Let's get your new slide here. Fantastic, thank you so much. And excellent questions, everyone. This has been so fun. Okay, so addressing common focus group challenges, right? I know that it can be difficult to manage the conversation during a the tips that you that can help uh, you ensure that everyone has a chance to participate and that the conversation doesn't get too sidetracked. So on this next slide here, um, what you want to do is encourage people who haven't spoken to share. Um, if someone hasn't spoken um, or hasn't answered any of the questions yet, you can say, 
hey, I haven't heard from a few of you yet. You don't have to call anyone out, but just say in general, hey, there's some of you that I actually haven't heard from yet. Is there anyone who hasn't said anything that would like to share? Like I said, you don't want to single out individuals who haven't spoken because the conversation is voluntary. But I just found that that's a good way to work around some people who haven't quite shared yet um, just by saying, hey, you know, I haven't heard from everyone. I really want to hear from everyone. Like some of the people who haven't shared yet, they may be feel comfortable weighing in on this, right? Manage long talkers or conversation dominators. You might get some of these, and it's so great that you have someone who's so enthusiastic, right? Um, however, some people will want to respond to every question or will talk over or interrupt other participants. Um, often a person who is doing so might just feel really passionate um, about the subject or they might not feel like they're being heard. So in, it can be helpful for the facilitator in these cases to reflect back what they're hearing um, to the person before moving on to ensure that one person doesn't dominate. And you can say, you know, thank you for sharing your experience. I hear you saying this, you know, really reflect back on a summary of what they said. Um, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now I want to make sure that other people also have a chance to talk, you know, something like that. Make sure that you really affirm that you understood and you heard what they said and the thanks them for their participation. Transition the conversation to keep it flowing. Uh, there will be times when people want to talk about one topic for a really long time, um, or they will talk about a topic that might not be related to the focus group conversation. So it is the job really of you, the facilitator, to keep the conversation on track. Uh, to transition back to the focus group questions or move the group along, you can say, hey, you know what, thank you everyone for what you shared about your experience with this topic or this situation, but I want to make sure that we have time to talk about a few other topics. So I'm going to move this along, right? That is a good way that I have been able to exercise moving the topic along while not, you know, completely, you know, shutting down the rich conversation that's happening about another topic. You want to acknowledge and appreciate it, but you really want to say, hey, you know what, this has been really great. I really appreciate it, but I want to get through some more topics today. So I'm going to move us along. Okay, so now um, we are going to summarize what we have learned. So I do have a quick about five, six minute video in here that I hope Gabby can share. I don't know if you all want to go into sharing it right now or you want to address some of the questions um, before that's in the chat. How, do you, how would you like to do it? I think we'll move right along. We'll get to the questions. You move right along? Okay, perfect. Time. Fantastic. Okay, does that audio play for you all? I am not hearing it. Okay, no dice. I apologize, I'm not able to share the audio. Um, Tiffany, do you want to um, move into the next part and we can answer some questions and share these videos afterward? Yeah, sure. And the, the links to the videos are in the notes of the slide. Um, so if you wanna put it in the chat maybe for people to see um, but basically what that video was, was about a six minute video, um, summarizing everything that we talked about. Um, Cause I just wanted to make sure uh, that everyone got some of those tips and some of that information. So we, if you can put it in the chat, that would be so lovely. Will do. So I'm gonna move us right along here. Thank you. And also, unfortunately, with let's putting it to practice, I did have a video <laughs> that was an example of a good focus group, an example of a focus group that needed a little bit of improvement. Um, Gabby, there isn't a way in which you can share it directly from YouTube. The link is in the chat. Let's just see. I will try to yeah, do that. It's not that was totally fine. Yeah, I, I will so, send those links directly to the chat. I'm wondering, Yaz, if you want to read um, Faith's question from the question and answer while we're getting tough to work. Well, thanks. Absolutely, so Faith thank had you. Another great question. Um, Faith asks, is it common to schedule a follow-up session? What if you run out of time? Oh, I see that from Faith. Yes, and she also said, would you reach out to select folks after to glean further insights? Yeah, so... I would say that um, when it comes down to scheduling follow-up sessions, I have done that once. And it was really because there was, um, there was a lot more that people really wanted to say. We really enjoyed the topic and 
people, we actually did, you know, run out of time <laughs> and people really wanted to get more feedback. So I did ask, you know, for permission for my team to be able to do a follow up uh, session. So in terms of the commonality of it, I'm not quite sure in terms of how common it is, but it's something that does happen. It's something that I have done. And in terms of reaching out to select folks, I actually just reached out to the same group of people, right? It was a focus group of about eight people. And I reached out to all, all of them to invite them for a follow-up session. Not all of them came. Um, I think uh, maybe about like six of them or something came. Uh, but since I was okay with that small number, <laughs> since it was uh, a follow-up and we already had gotten a lot of information in the first session, um, I was okay with having a smaller number. That's who I was able to gather information from. Um, but yes, you can absolutely, as appropriate, if you run out of time and this is more that people went to say and the conversation got cut off for whatever reason, if you had tech issues on Zoom, um, and you said, I meant, oh, sorry, Faith, I'm reading this in real time. I'm sorry, I meant contact someone individually if you wanted to hear more about their perspective. Oh, okay. Um, yes, you can absolutely do that. that if, if you contact someone individually, that'll be a little bit more like a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, and I think, you know, if there's something that's very unique and intriguing about their perspective that you want to learn more from, and you think that it'll be appropriate to ask them questions directly in a one-on-one, -on -one, more private basis to get a little bit more information from them, you can absolutely do that. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying, Faith. And I know that David has a question about note-taking. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, David Anderson. Sorry, Jasmine. I just I'm just in the Q and A right now, and I just saw it. So I am sorry. <laughs> um, but you said I'm a big fan of taking notes on a poster board or electronic board during focus group discussions. Interesting, so that participants um, know their points will be reflected in print and can edit at the moment. Uh huh. Do you like taking shared notes, or do you prefer to record discussions and code it later? Or do you have a preference according to the situation? Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, David, I think it's great. Like if doing the electronic board has worked for you and you really like that, I think that's awesome. I personally, um, in terms of note taking, you know, I use that really more for my internal purposes. Um, I haven't always, um, you know, done the note taking to really share it back with the group. Um, I had done the note taking for just me and my team to really make sure that we capture everything for internal purposes. And so we do both. We record this, the, the sessions, right? And I use those transcripts to help with the coding, but we also um, do the note taking as well to make sure that, you know, everything you know, it's captured on both ends, right? Because the note taking is really important to make sure we get the high level information, but the recording complements the note taking because it helps make sure that you don't miss anything. I do have a personal preference for doing it like that because the shared, the notes, well not the shared notes, but just the notes in particular, I use more only for the research team and the internal purposes. And that is the reason why I like to reflect back to the group verbally to make sure that people can correct me verbally in real time or to edit um, anything that I said uh, when it comes down to what I heard them say, and that could be reflected in the notes. So I normally don't uh, share notes, and I like to keep that internal with the research team because that really is for our information gathering and analysis purposes. But if the electronic board has really worked for you, I, I you know, I love that. Yeah. All right, well, it looks like the videos are not going to play nice with us today. So Dr. Producer has put the links to both videos into the chat, and we would encourage you to go look at those um, and learn a bit from those videos as well as examples. And Tiffany, I'm going to put these slides back up for your conclusions, and we can kind of go through any questions anyone has. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I just have two conclusion slides here about uh, kind of the do's and the don'ts, right? So I'm going to start with the do's here. You do want to be early to your session to set up the room. Um, you want to open the session up with a fun, you know, maybe non-threatening, uh, open-ended question that will really enable everyone to develop a comfort level with speaking in front of the group and sharing their ideas. Uh, pay attention to nonverbal signals. Uh, someone might cue that they're not feeling very comfortable or might have something to say. So you really want to be aware of that, right? This is the reason why I like being in a circle. Um, so you can really look at people, you know, and catch their, their nonverbal cues and catch their energy to make sure that everyone's feeling comfortable in the room. Um, you do want to ask uh, open-ended questions one at a time. A probe when a question is unclear. 
and ask, can you say more about instead of what do you think? Uh, the latter may make participants feel as if they need to defend the point of view. We don't want that. Uh, please uh, balance participation by asking who else has something to say, uh, or I would like to hear more from dot, dot, dot. Um, redirect the conversation when it strays too far off topic, like we said before. Say something like, these are important and interesting points. However, we need to bring the discussion back to our main focus, right? Um, also, record the participants' actual words as much as possible. Avoid the temptation to paraphrase, right? This will show each participant that his or her ideas are unique and important. And check with participants that, that you understand what they are saying. Um, so that's what I like to do and to make sure that the notes are as accurate as possible, but that recording also really helps make sure that we capture everything. And on the full, second to last slide here, I'm going to do the don't. We can move on to those don'ts there. There you go. Um, don't read the script questions verbatim. This may come off too stiff and formal. That's why you want to be familiar with those questions. Uh, finish people's sentences or make assumptions about what's being said. Um, don't allow one or two more people to dominate or use the focus group for their own agenda. Uh, permit side discussion. This can distract um, others from the main discussion. Take sides to challenge what is being said. Remain impartial, please. Uh, share your opinions verbally or non-verbally and favor one participant over the others or use jargon or technical terms that might not be known by everyone in the group. All right, and this last slide here, is just a thank you slide. <laughs> for, for your participation, I know we have I think, 10 more minutes for some questions, but I just want to thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all the questions. Amazing questions. You are really into the content. You're really thinking about it. You're really asking the important questions. I love it, love it, love it. That is my email. That is my Gmail. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, that is also my LinkedIn too. We can put we can put that in the chat possibly. So if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, happy to connect. I would love to stay in touch with you all. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And I see that some folks are typing uh, questions in the chat. Please go ahead and, and ask I that question. That. I have just a few minutes here. Um, and while we're waiting for that to be typed, I have a question as well. Um, you know from Peace Corps days that participatory activities are huge. And so I was just wondering about your opinion on those, you're utilizing those, and if you have any ones that are kind of your go-to to develop conversation. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I am a huge fan of my participatory methods. It was something that we definitely had to learn and do. Um, we were in Peace Corps, yeah, as for y'all, all of us here, <laughs> return Peace Corps volunteers. Um, so I have a very uh, unique participatory method that I actually did like to use, Gabby. Um, so when I was in Peace Corps, I didn't actually do um, a lot of like focus groups or anything, but the participatory method that I did really like to do was a seasonal calendar. Um, I think you might be familiar with that one because where I served, there were, you know, hot seasons, there were rainy seasons, there were harvest seasons, there were farming seasons. And I really wanted to know when all those seasons actually took place um, because it helped me learn the culture. It helped me learn what the community does, what their schedule is. And it really helped me to appropriately schedule programs um, around when people were going to be busy, um, when people were going to be available and really had the opportunity to really engage with my program. So I really liked using that seasonal calendar. And it also, the community also was really, really excited to sort of share that with me and educate me, you know, on how, what, their, what their lives are like um, on a yearly basis um, and what their schedule is like. So it helped me learn more about them and it helped them share more of themselves with me, which is good with building rapport. And it really helped us work together to schedule community meetings, schedule just a lot of trainings and programming that we wanted to do around that schedule. So I would look at the seasonal calendar and be like, everyone's gonna be farming during these two months. So I probably shouldn't do it during this time, right? So in terms of some of the participatory things that we learned in Peace Corps, the seasonal calendar was like my go-to. Thank you. And I wanted to say, I mean, of course, of course. And I think Haron, I, I wanted to, I know you had a last question uh, her own, but I, I, I'm not, I'm looking at the, I'm not quite sure what that last question was. I definitely want to respect that um, and get to that last question. Was it the one about the challenges or limitations associated with focus groups? Was it that one? 
ethical consideration. Okay, that one. Yes. Okay. Um. So yeah, yeah. I, I do. I do really like this question because, as a researcher, and you know, you know, Yasmin and Gabby and, and Dr. Peters and a lot of you, ethics are really important to me. Um, especially as you, we've seen in history when research has not always been that ethical, right? And it's been uh, dehumanizing to people and we don't want that to happen. So when it comes down to ethical considerations researchers can keep in mind when conducting focus groups, um, yes, confidentiality and privacy is key, right? So that's when I talked about, you know, when you're building up that protocol, making sure, number one, the purpose is clear. Uh, making sure that they're allowed to ask questions about the what the purpose is, about the goals. Making sure that you have informed consent, right? It's best to have a consent form, right? Where people are allowed to either verbally or write, like sign a, a consent form where they're allowed to uh, consent to being a part of the, you know, of the focus group or, and, and you know, and to record and participate and that they fully understand. Uh, what we're trying to do, because someone is confused or they don't understand, they should not sign that informed consent. So yes, those are the ethics of, you know, we want people to understand what they're doing, why they're here, what the goals are, consent to being a part of it by signing the consent form, consent to the recording, and we want to know what, you know, is how the information is going to be used and how it's going to be shared back, right? Um, something that I also want, also want you to consider in terms of ethics is not just only that um, informed consent, but also, like I said, in the facilitator, right? Making sure that that person is culturally congruent, linguistically congruent, and, you know, that the people can really feel comfortable um, speaking to that person and that, that person is someone that, that has a sense of familiarity um, with them. The space also is another ethical thing as well, because we don't want to do it in the space where people can feel uncomfortable sharing because other people might be listening, right? You want to have that confidentiality of the space as well. Um, I think, yeah, those are really, and also with the incentives, right? I think someone asked about ethical incentives. You want to make sure that it doesn't seem like you're bribing anyone, but having those very neutral, you know, standard incentives of gift cards or even like food, um, especially if you're taking somebody's evening, um, is, is really important as well. So I think that, yeah, when it comes down to ethics, consent, 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 written, verbal, asking people to record, making sure that they understand what's being used, how it's being used, how it's being shared back. Definitely keep in touch with your program participants after I have absolutely done this. When the report was done, I shared it with all the people who I knew participated in the focus group. And what I've also done very recently is that I had a webinar <laughs> similar to this, where I shared the findings back, with not only with my client who hired me to do the group, to do the work, uh, but also with the people who participated. I said, hey, you know, thank you so much for participating. Here is the report. And hey, I'm actually presenting on this. Come. <laughs> so you can see uh, what the findings were. Um, that's something that's also very participatory, um, as, as Gabby said, and that's something that's also, I think, really respectful of them is that they're, it's transparent and that everyone can see what the final product was. I, I really love doing that. I, I hope, Perrin, that that answers kind of like the ethical considerations, but it's really about consent, informed consent, um, and about, you know, transparency and dissemination and making sure that things are shared back. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you so much okay. for taking us all on this wonderful journey of learning about focus groups. <laughs> I know I learned a ton. I know our audience definitely did too. It was such a pleasure to get to know you and learn from your experiences today. We all learned how useful the focus group data can be for discovering the story and getting rich qualitative data and how to effectively design focus groups. Uh, the tips that you shared, oh my goodness, were so helpful. Uh, memorizing focus groups questions to facilitate the flow, the ethical and cultural considerations, which we all need to consider, and participant consent. You said it. Consent, consent, consent. I encourage our audience mm -hmm. to take a look at Tiffany's videos from YouTube just to reinforce what we learned today. Um, uh, we're also going to be posting this um, this recording on YouTube. I'm going to uh, put the link in the chat quickly. Um, but yes, thank you, our audience, and thank you, Tiffany, for joining us today. We appreciate the time you've taken uh, to speak about focus groups. Our next webinar is going to be on February 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, with our alumna, uh, Ashley Bishop. She will be discussing how she has
Review's oh. most significant change in the final program evaluation of Girls Education Project in Mali. For more information on that webinar, please use the link um, uh, that we'll be providing. Um, Dr. Beverly Peters is going to be posting it on LinkedIn, um, and you can check out her profile in the chat as well. So thank you all so much. I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon, night, morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.